All right. Let's get going. So, all right. So this is this is the figure I'm going to paint. This is the uh, Watcher, KDM Watcher. I'm gonna. He's got like a whole bunch of lanterns and stuff. I am going to start with the airbrush. So we're going to make some noise. Tons of OSL. Just using some gray primer. So basically, this is way too high. Good evening. So I'm at like 20 PSI or something. Roughly 20. So the idea is we're going to have two alternating colors. So we're going to do like the tip, the contrasting sort of bluish gray on top and then orange light from below. Focusing most of the light uh, for the, the grayish tones up towards his head. Trying to build it up slowly. Okay. So just like that. Then I want to get all of these lanterns. I'm going to have to do another coat over top of them to make sure they're like really bright white. But this gray primer will at least help give me a, a starting base coat.
Oh, it's shaking everywhere. All right, I'm gonna use my thumb to stabilize this. No, it's just uh, the Vallejo gray primer. I mean, Steino Res would work, but... Doing this now with the airbrush is going to uh, save a lot of time later. Basically, we're I'm making a um, like a grisaille with the airbrush instead. It's like kind of like Xenophil priming, but trying to be a bit more controlled with it. Hi Mauricio. Hi Sammy. No, the snow's not done. I'm waiting on uh, a shipment of plants. Uh, I'm going to probably post a, uh, depending, they're supposed to be here Friday, but depending on when they come in, I'll, ma I'll make like a, I'll record an Instagram reel and show how I did it, how I do the snow. Alright, so we're trying to I'm trying to build up the layers slowly. I don't want to do this too much. If you build it up slow and kind of thin, uh, it's gonna help not get so much of that like speckling you get.
I varnish my paintings before, but I've yet to varnish my plastic. Do you have any recommendation? So, yeah, there's a few. Um, AK, I like the AK, uh, the Ultra Matte. You can mix it with a little gloss varnish if you want to, to get like a more, slightly more satin finish. The reason I like the Ultra Matte is because you can go super matte if you want, and then you can mix it with red gloss to get somewhere in between. Okay. So now that I've done that, uh, I've got a pretty decent base coat on all the lanterns. Now I can start to think about like where the actual lanterns would shine. So I can kind of approach the lanterns from like here, thinking about like what direction the light goes. and use, use the airbrush slowly to build up. Uh, it's a little thin at the moment. It's a little too thin for my taste. I want it just slightly more opaque. I'm gonna put a couple more drops. Uh, you, you can apply it in a pretty thick coat. You don't have to be like super careful with, with applying the varnish. So the way light works is it adds, right? So when you get multiple lanterns together, they're going to, the light will stack on top of each other and get brighter. The most important part is that the lanterns themselves are the brightest, and you'll see how I handle that later, but we want to think about where like each lantern would cast light. This is a little, a little high. So if you get, if you're getting that spider webbing thing where the, the spray is kind of going all over the place, you can turn it down, turn the air pressure down a little bit. And that can help you control the spray a little more. So here, right, I want the light to be brightest near the near the lantern. But also, the bottom of the lantern is closed off, so it wouldn't cast light, right? So you, you get the light on the sides of the lanterns, not on the uh, underneath. So if I approach each one individually, thinking about how the light falls off the further you get away. Oops, something like that. I know in between these two lanterns is where it would be really bright because you're getting light from both of the lanterns.
That's what happens when you apply too much at once. And then apply some to the base. Like that. Oh, I'm sprit spritzing. I got clogged. Make sure your needle's clear. Uh, they got a package? I didn't know if you wanted it. A package, thank you. Mm -hmm. From Black Crow, we're not gonna. Like up here got messed up, but I'll just cover it up later. Yeah, open it on stream. Go ahead. That'd be, uh, that's a great idea. See, so, trying to apply the, uh, the light in like a V shape, right? Oh yeah, I definitely trust you guys to keep a secret.
Yeah, that's not happening. You, you can forget about me painting Rudek Dragon. No way. Now, let's just get a general amount of ambient light from up underneath. And we will come back to the airbrush. But now we can do some sketching and refine the sketch. just need some kind of sky gray or whatever any kind of gray will will do I'm just looking for the correct value can go in and fix some areas that got a little messy. So like some of this is got a bit rough. I don't want it to be, don't want the base to be super bright. I'm actually going to take and water this down and just kind of apply it as a wash to get it in some of the, the cracks and stuff of the faces.
Okay. Simple, simple bluish kind of top light, orange from the bottom. That's the plan. He's also wearing a black robe to keep the robe in the blackish tone. So that's going to be another important thing to keep in mind is that uh, don't want to. Uh, have the light be too intense on the robe if it's supposed to look black, right? So here I can just pick out some of these little volumes that the airbrush didn't quite get to that I want to highlight a little. I want to keep them dark, dark and spooky. Okay. Let me dry this with the hair dryer real quick. Now, I'm going to use some overcoats.
I'm going to mix a little of the uh, turquoise and the black. Turquoise. Oh, I paint like her. So by spraying the contrast or the express color directly over the the grisale, right? Grisale is the the black and white sketch. We can get a, a quick effect of the uh, the color on top of the gray, right? So that's that part. Now let's get a little fancy with something. Let's do let's do something a little a little fancy. So if we look at this lantern, right? This one right here. You can see this S shape mm -hmm. that blocks out the light. can take a grayish mixture 
I need a really pointy brush for this. I'm not going pure black, but with a gray. Now, if we think about that shape and then the inside shape, so there's another one on the, the inside of the lantern. And think about that and you get a, a cast of that shape, that S shape from the lantern, right? But it's going to be all stretched out. Something like that, and then as it comes down and around, and that makes sense what's happening there. And then the other side would do the same thing, but think about, right? It's got to be the same as the other one. So here you get a kind of S, S shape, and we'll clean up the, the shape. So the closer it is to the lantern, the more defined that that thing's going to be, right? And then the further away from it is, the blurry it'll the blurrier it'll be. So as it goes further away, I want to soften that. That shape some. Because it gets like stretched out.
Hello. Nearly an engineer. Thanks for following. Welcome. Okay. And then closest to the lantern is where it's going to be like really defined. And this should actually come like right underneath the lantern. So I'm going to grab a little more and I'm going to try and push this S like right up inside that shape. Something like that. And then right up here, right? So you get that V, that kind of like double V shape as the light pushes outwards. And we don't want this too dark underneath because you got all these other lanterns, but they're not like directly next to a light source, right? So they're not going to be quite as sharp. Like these are, these are too far from this, right? This is very far to make that shape or the, like those cast shadows. These are, this is literally like right next to it. Hello, Shin 40k. Thanks for following. Welcome. All right, cool. And we could do, we can do the same thing on these. I'm 
right? So if they're all going the same direction, so if the S goes this way, you get the opposite S going the other way, right? So the S would start like right here, and then it would get stretched way out and it becomes wider as it goes. Until it just fades away. And then gets more defined as you get closer. And, and then it'll get looser as it fades, fades into the distance. If you want to learn more about this, what this kind of effect, um, it's called the umbra and the penumbra. It's why sh shadows are like when you stand outside and the sun shadows are like really sharp next to your feet, and then as the, your sh shadow gets cast further, it becomes less defined. That one doesn't have to be perfect. Okay, this one's got an S and then like a triangle thing. And it goes the other direction. So here we have to start like this. Then it comes down now and it'll get looser as it comes further away it would come back in and then there's like a uh, little like three line thing that's probably too small to really see And eventually these shadows would like stack on top of each other. Something like that. Just remember that the light, if you try and do this, just remember that the light would act like a mirror. So it would be reverse of whatever you're seeing, right? So like here, I'm going to go ahead and darken this in up top because we're doing the, the triangle, right? That cone shape from the lantern itself.
all under here would be dark. So that's that's the the cone shape you get. It might it might cone more than that. Like if you think about the light here. So you can draw lines, right? So if the light's in the center and it gets caught on that, then you can draw a line from here and it would come out like this. Same up top, catches this lip, doesn't have, can't go any higher. Here, mm, comes like this. I think that one's kind of fine because then it gets stuck underneath there. And then this has the reverse. So here it comes up and then as it comes away, eventually fades out. On this side of this fold, it can't even really see this. So this here would kind of be in dark. Then comes back in. Comes more defined, then stretches back out again and creates these little lines. That, that fade out into the distance. Oh, makes sense. Now a couple of these, because the light's not perfect, or the it's not an exact point, it's kind of dis, uh, diffused by the the shape of the, or the glass, if the glass is slightly foggy, you get softer shadows. So I can give just a little bit of extra light near the, the inside. Alright, something like that. Cool. Now, what color, when you have a lantern light, do you really get on black? It's, I will tell you, it is not yellow. It's more like a orangish brown. The lanterns will be more yellow, so we're going to use Mar Martian orange to do the flames to just cover over what we've what we've done, right? Because these paints specifically 
are transparent, we can paint over top of the the black and white just like we did with the turquoise and as it turns more black that orange will yep, fade out this is going to mess up because I'm going to be spraying all over the lanterns, this is going to mess up the lanterns, but it'll give us a kind of orangish base coat. Then we'll paint back over the lanterns and then make them yellow. That just goes right over top. original.
Okay. Hey, that makes sense. This gives us a rough idea of what all the uh, effects will be. Some of these that are like really close, we can adjust. Uh, I'm at like 15 right now. This is a pretty thin paint though. I'm at between 15 and 18 at the moment. Now, I do want just a little bit more of like a brownish tone. I'm gonna grab Mulder and Willow TV, hello. I want just a touch of this uh, cavalry brown color that's a bit more of a reddish, reddish brown. I'm going to thin this way out. Now this one is going to have coverage, so I have to be careful with it. This will affect the blacks, but I want to get some color in the like really dark black areas. And this will help fade out some of that orange, orange to black and give me some, a little bit of transition. You got the vid, dude? guy out then we will rebase coat the lanterns and work on uh, making those nice and bright which will help really solidify that effect I'm actually gonna
Cool. Alright, so there you go. Initial sketch with basically the airbrush, a little bit of brush work, and then uh, just applying filters, right? And I will be back in a few. Let's really get a solid base, base coat on the uh, lanterns. I know it looks whitish now, but we can we can do even better. So we want the lanterns to be extremely bright. They should be the brightest thing on the whole figure. This, this step is important to really get like a nice white base coat for when we uh, go to place the color on top, right? Because we, I want a very saturated, extremely bright color on top of these lanterns. I do not want them to look dull 
in any way. They're supposed to be admitting light, so got to make them as bright as possible. And it might might take more than one coat to really get them white, but it'll be worth it. Make sure I didn't miss anything. Some very hard to reach areas that some of these like back here it's not as important just get it as good as you can if you can't see it without turning it at some crazy angle it doesn't matter that much White, they're very white now. some bubble bubblies right. oh, let me go hair dry that
We need to come on. Come on, camera. Eh? Okay. Need to make sure that's nice and dry. Because the next step is to put a white or a yellow uh, over top of it. So I'm going to use Imperial Yellow. It's me every time. PK Climber, hello. Thanks for following. Okay. So just applying this yellow liberally throughout uh, on all the lanterns. So if we didn't get that nice uh, white base coat, this yellow would not be as vibrant. I get it all. Thanks, Chromium. Cool. Something like that. All right. Now... 
Now we can play with lightning of all oh, that's drying in a few spots closest to the lanterns. I'm going to gram. A bay, like a beige, something that's just got a little bit of coverage. I could use the white, but the white's going to be a little strong. And I'm going to use warm yellow. Nice and nice and thin. Near some of these uh, where it's closest to the lantern. I'm just going to punch in the light a little bit more. Where these are like really, really close. Building it up slowly. something like that and here I need to come in at like a more extreme angle so I can get in almost behind the uh, lantern Thanks. It's one of my favorite also. Um, I just don't even really think of it as like OSL anymore. You kind of, once you, once you start thinking about everything is just like light. It all, it all kinds of just becomes the same technique and you're not really painting OSL or anything like that anymore. You're just you're just painting the light. Ugh. 
uh, this is just warm yellow mixed with some beige. Chimera. Chimera warm yellow mixed with a little bit of beige just to give just to give some coverage. And I'll blend that out when I uh, with a little orange on top. And I'm just trying to punch up the light a little bit, and then I'll add a light, uh, blend, blend the yellow into the orange a little more. Now I can grab some kind of orange here. We'll just So, blend the two out like that. If any part needs to be, if it's too abrupt, I can just take in a lighter color and glaze towards the light source, right? I'm going to glaze towards the light source because then I'm depositing the most amount of paint where the light is so I'm making a more more opacity in paint at the the actual light source and not the other way
О. Is it looking glowy yet? Is it is it properly glowy? Okay. You can do that as long as you want. Just just keep blending it out like crazy and refining. All right, now, what do we do about the little things on the actual uh, lanterns, right? You might think, ah, oh, paint it black. No, you don't want to paint the, uh, the trim of the lanterns black because if you want them to look like what they might actually be blank, but we're trying to create a glow effect. Like, think of your, like we're taking a photo of the miniature or something. The light would be so intense that uh, the glow would extend beyond the the little shapes, right, are onto the little filigree. So we're actually going to make the filigree like a deep reddish brown. And 
That way the light looks like it's spilling on top of the filigree. Also, on some of these bigger lanterns, before I even paint the filigree, I'm going to take just a little bit of this yellow mixed with some of the white. And I'm going to, in like the center of them, so not like the center of each panel, but like the center of where your eye would look, I'm going to I'm going to add just a little bit of that light white right in the middle. The yellowish white right here. Where like the flame would be if you were looking at it. So it creates like a, a glow right in the middle of the lantern. Now it's even more intense. I know, Aubrey. Rashido, hello. Thanks for following. Okay, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna go glasses for this. <laughs> Trying to paint these really thin lines. See, by not using pure black on the, uh, the filigree, it makes it look like the light is like spilling over onto the filigree, right? 
it's got a like an inner like an inner light spilling on onto it. Thanks, Wash Mogul. If you missed any part, uh, I upload the replays to YouTube. So if you want to go back, you can check out this and all the previous streams on YouTube. So see, does that make sense? See how it it's so bright that it it looks like the light's shining almost through, spilling onto the uh, the cage. This is the Watcher from Kingdom Death. Exactly, Leaf. If I used pure black, it wouldn't look as glowy. Make sure I get all of these parts underneath. The lip, you gotta flip it over sometimes so you can get this rim. Here you can see I missed uh, when I was doing the, the color before. So I can take just some of the contrast yellow and, the, and some of this orange. Just glaze, glaze over top. Couldn't see down in there. I missed when I was painting down in there. So just apply some orange.
maybe there would be a little little line or something from the lantern could make the little black and brown Anybody have any questions? Basically, we did a, uh, a Grisail sketch with the hairbrush. So, metallic is really tough when doing OSL. Metallic, or with tinted metallic. So, do you mean actual metallic paints, or do you mean just a metallic effect? Because if you're talking about metallic paints, metallic paints are tough with, uh, yeah, so metallic paints are tough with OSL because they are naturally going to, like, be affected by your real lights, and often they will look brighter than your OSL because... You can never paint a light source to look as bright as what like a reflect a real reflected light would be. So I, I often find that um, non-metallics tend to work better with OSL effects. So now we get the the nice glow inside the lantern cage, right? And if I want, I can even take some of this light orange, mix it with just a little bit of the the red. And on some of these parts closest to like the main glow, I can I can lighten these up even more. Okay. Now, on the parts like down here, where I want this old iron effect, now I can add some little bit of, little bit of black to the mixture. This part back here doesn't look great. I'm actually just going to take this and... 
because you'll almost never see this. I'm just going to fill this in. This is little, like you get like five degrees of angle to basically see that part of the lantern. So I'm not super worried about it. Do you plan the scene before painting? What do you mean? How do you mean? I mean, he's not really so much of a scene. He's not like super complicated. So in this case, not really. I didn't plan much of anything other than like, I want these glowy and then I want a bluish turquoise kind of light from above just to give some shapes to the robe. But nothing, nothing too fancy on him. If it was a more complex scene and not just like a figure, you know, then maybe I would do more planning, but not too much going on on him to have to worry about all that. All right. Before I do that, let me remember to Add some of this very white yellow back in. Like here. All right. I want to make sure some of these parts are very white. The color surrounding, when you do OSL, like say it say a lightsaber, right? What's really the part of the lightsaber that informs you what color it is? Because it's not really the lightsaber itself. It's other than like the very edge of it. A lot of times what the the color it emits onto other objects is what's really informing you what color it is. Because the the blade is normally almost pure white. Other than just like the hint of color around the edge. So here, with just the little bit of yellow around the edges of the lanterns. That subtle yellow effect. We could paint almost the whole lantern white just have a touch of yellow and you you'd know that what color the lanterns are the lantern light is based off of the context around the lantern does that make sense Thanks, Dan. How are you? Kyle, 
Kyra? Kyra? Is that... Uh... Is that the Black Crow Halfling? Hmm. I got a new black crow model in earlier. You missed it. <laughs> you dang right, I didn't open the box. I like to do this is this is just me but I like to do when I'm doing these lanterns the top and bottom of the each lantern and then I like to do the the middle so I go all the way around the the rim Painting ketchup and mustard over here. In the UK? What's going on in the UK? Ah, uh, see, we found one. Oh, weird. I did not hear about that. Right, let's grab some of the gray. Actually, I'm just going to grab some of this beige, because this is going to have nice coverage. So I can just paint this part of the lantern real quick. No matter what, without fail, one one little panel pane, I guess, of the lantern was going to get missed. It was inevitable. Missed, I missed putting some yellow back there too. So we'll go ahead and do that at the same time. Way in the back back here where I can't even see. Whatever, that works. Uh, 
let's zoom out for a second and just take a look. Okay, working. Still got to add more light to the head, but Now, some people have done his face like glowing on the inside. I personally don't love that because of the way his head is kind of leaning downward and his face is quite buried in the uh, the hood. You have to, it only really looks great. Like this is for gaming, right? So this is a gaming figure. So it doesn't really look great until you like hold him up to the light like if you're looking at them with light shining directly down into the uh into the face or lack of face i guess very difficult to get a really strong osl when it's buried really deep um so like if you wanted to do glowing skeleton eyes or something glowing eyes in a skull sometimes it's best to like kind of fill it in with a little milliput and then paint paint the, the glowing eyes that way you're you're not combating the natural shadows as much Heck the planet, dude. I like the second. I feel like that's another major hacking recently. Didn't Southwest Airlines get hacked? Is that what happened? Or, or did theirs just, like, crash? Oh, I missed another one. Oh, good.
my flight to Italy from Monty, we got stuck on the runway, or not even the runway, at the gate while boarded for two hours because anytime they refuel, they have to like send them a receipt basically for the fuel. It's a, you know, legal, it's part of the law to keep track of, you know, we put this much fuel in before whatever taking off. Uh, and they were having trouble digitally transmitting it, the system to like transmit the receipt to the plane to say, hey, you've been, you've got this X amount of fuel, whatever, you're good to take off. Wasn't working. So they had to basically manually print out or write a receipt whenever for the fuel so that we could take off and um yeah they like didn't know how to do it i guess it had been so long since they'd like manually written one it took two hours for them to get us a uh a receipt It was awesome. I really enjoyed just sitting on the plane, not going anywhere for two hours. Yeah, I heard a lot of people got stuck in Vegas. I've always said, I, I love traveling. I love going places. I love teaching, going to conventions and stuff. I hate airports. I hate airlines. I hate flying on commercial airlines. If I ever was to win like the massive lottery and become a billionaire overnight, would I buy a new house? No, I'm happy in my house. Don't really need a whole lot, but... I would fly private everywhere. Just roll up. I, I would straight up, like, don't care. Sorry, environment. I am taking my private jet everywhere. It would be the one thing that I would, like, spend an absurd amount of money on. Just roll up to the Roll up to the airport in your limousine, get off, get out of the limousine, get on your jet and just leave.
bring all the crap I want. Don't have to worry about TSA putting my miniatures through x-ray machines and trying to break crap. Be balling, dude. Rolling up to my private jet in my sweatpants. Heck yeah. I don't blame him, man. You can you can hate on uh, that. <laughs> you can hate on Elon Musk as much as you want for other dumb, sh dumb shit or Jeff Bezos or any of those guys. I don't blame them one bit for flying a private jet around. I'd do it too. And as nice as high-speed rail would be in the U.S., that all comes down to, like, problems with, like, interstate rules and all this other stuff. It's annoying. Yeah, until you go to Spain, and Spain has different tracks. Because Franco was like, they're going to invade. So we're going to make different train tracks for our country, like a different gauge, so that uh, countries can't, like any invaders can't use our our rail line to get supplies in and out of our country. That's why if you want to take a train to like Madrid from Paris, you have to go to Barcelona first and then change trains because then there's a different line that runs from Barcelona to Madrid. So not everywhere in Europe runs on high-speed rail.
fact, I don't even know how much there is of it once you, uh, I don't know how much there is of high-speed rail once you get east of Berlin. They also have crazy high population density in, in Europe. Um, like, Paris is massive, dude. There's like three major cities in, in France. And Paris makes up, like, a gigantic portion of the population compared to the U.S., where we're actually kind of spread out. Like, Richmond, Virginia is not that heavy of, like, high of population density. We like living in the, the burbs. Like you could probably do like a high speed rail from DC to New York, which I think there is one or faster one. And then what you do like DC to Pittsburgh or something or Philadelphia to Pittsburgh and then Pittsburgh to Chicago like there's so many stops on the way and so many other little towns like thinking of all the major population centers on the east coast to the midwest right when you got to cross over the appalachians but then you get like pittsburgh indianapolis columbus uh cincinnati detroit chicago Minneapolis, like, it's a lot. And how long does that take? Yeah, but that that's another thing. Like, China is rapidly expanding all their rail lines. So, like, they can kind of plan around that, right? We already have a bunch of... We already have a bunch of rail lines from, like, 200 years ago. And now we're trying to, like, retro... We, we'd be like trying to retrofit them instead of building all new rail. It 
They can't even get one working from within California, from like San Francisco to San Diego. You want them to build one across mountains and interstate? Couldn't even get my city to build a, uh, so Norfolk, Virginia has a light rail and couldn't even get Virginia Beach to connect it from downtown Norfolk to the, to the ocean front. They're like, no, we don't want that. We can't have undesirables coming to the beachfront. I was at the beach the other week, uh, last, actually, Saturday, uh, yeah, Saturday. I went down to the beachfront for a friend's birthday to go to a distillery. And, dude, it's so dead in the winter, in the winter time. If there was a light rail and like people could actually take the light rail to like go to restaurants and stuff. But no. We don't want that. Let's just crowd up 264 and have a bunch of drunk drivers. That's a good idea. I hate the ocean front, the boardwalk and the ocean front. I basically avoid it whenever possible. Yeah, well, Tokyo to Osaka is like one of the fastest rails. That thing's crazy. I mean, if we had self-flying private cars, or flying self self-piloting cars, I don't know. How much noise pollution, dude? You know how loud drones are. <laughs> if we had, if we had so, if we had flying cars, the amount of noise pollution would be insane.
honestly, Sean, Jets have gotten pretty quiet. Like all the F8, the F22s and stuff, they're really not that, that bad. They're a lot quieter than I remember as a kid with like the F-14s and stuff. Those things were loud. They fly over and shake your house. Now it's... I hardly even never hear them now. The only thing I really hear is helicopters. Because maybe if I lived at Oceana or something and you were hearing jets like take off and land all the time, then maybe... I guess if you live near Langley Air Force Base. Oh, you talking about avoiding... Yeah, I don't know anybody who's like a local that really goes down to the ocean front. Acrylic Geek. Raiding with a party of 18. Hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome in. Uh, what are we doing? What were you doing? In case anybody didn't really get what I was talking about, I live near like two of the large, like literally the largest naval base in the world. And uh, fighter jets are stationed in Oceana, Virginia Beach. Naval Station Oceana. And the jets and stuff take off from there all the time. And it used to be really, really loud. But now, yeah, I don't, I don't feel like I hear them as much anymore. And I, yes, I do live a little further from, from Virginia Beach now, but it's really not that bad. Well, you could go down to the beach now and go to a Sensations every two blocks and uh, whatever the ice cream place is. So, as, you know, while you're walking three blocks and you finish your ice cream, you can stop in and get another one. Exactly. Because it sucks. I 
I'm sure there's like some decent restaurants down there, but damned if I can think of any. Mid 80s, I was zero years old. Depending on when in the mid 80s you're talking about. I remember the Raven. And the Jewish mother used to be down there and they, they closed. Some AOS for Adepticon, Adepticons for Golden Demon or for uh, like your army. Well, in 87, I was two. Golden Demon, heck yeah. Cool. Cool. I have not even started my golden demon entry yet. Eventually. We'll get there. We'll get to it eventually. Yeah, dude, you're an old man. Bunch of old farts up in here. It was the summer of sixty nine. I don't think anybody remembers that one. All right, getting get more done. Yeah, how many more of these lanterns do I have to go? Like three or something? I don't know. All right, I'm gonna take a I'm gonna take a quick break. Take a quick smoke break. Try and finish these lanterns, and then uh, maybe on the ropes a little bit or something I don't know but I'll be back in a few I was hoping to finish this guy 
in the M1 sitting. But I don't think that'll happen tonight, so we might have to make him a two-parter. I'm still going to stream for like another hour or so, but I iced fishing. I don't know if we'll finish. Uh, yes, I can tell you which ones. I, I mean, I don't think it's a problem that I tell you which ones I painted. I painted um, I'm going to try and remember the names. The High Evolutionary. I painted Dark Beast. Airwalker. Uh, the Scroll Queen. And Ronin. No, I didn't paint any of the big ones. I would have liked to. That would have been pretty fun. Like Stature or Goliath or Devil Dinosaur, but would have would have enjoyed doing one of those. But no, I did not paint any of the, the larger figures. There's a few that I, I think would have been fun to paint other, otherwise, like uh, Hulkbuster. Actually, any of them from the, the World War Hulk set would have been cool. Uh, Agent Venom is really cool. I would have liked to paint that one. Gore the God Butcher would have been fun. Sure, there's other ones, but I think Ronan was the one I probably enjoyed the most. He was he was pretty cool. When I was asked to help out, a lot of them were already, already done by that point. Hey, Tucker. Still got a lot of work to do. This is the most time consuming bit. The painting all this little filigree stuff. Probably not the most interesting part to watch either, but it's got to get done. It's a big part of the effect.
and there's no there's no real shortcut to it. You just paint little little tiny lines. Try and be clean, don't mess up the work you've already done. No, sorry, the ones that before, um, the ones beforehand, uh, everything before the Lucasaba mushroom is lost to time. I wouldn't mind doing a, if, you know. If I ever get my hands on a Marvel chibi. I wouldn't mind doing another one of those at some point. Show you guys how how the uh, the studio schemes are done if you want. If someone's got uh, did anyone back the second season? What was the, uh, did anybody get the fin? You backed them all of them? If you send me, uh, if you send me Dr. Doom from the second set, from the Fantastic Four set and pay for shipping. I will paint it on stream for you. That is not an invitation for every person who backed that Kickstarter to send me a Marvel Chibi. Or right, you can send me a message on Instagram.
I just like Dr. Doom. Doom. Doom is the one character that I'm like actually excited to see in a movie then and not be garbage, hopefully. I swear if they make a Fantastic Four, when, when they make a Fantastic Four movie, because they are making it, if they screw up Doctor Doom, I'm going to be so mad. Yeah, the one on uh, the white god doom or whatever from, uh, what was the name of that series? Siege? Something like that? I forget. Not Siege, but uh, Battle World whatever, where all the plant, where all the multiverses cross over. Doom. He is one of my favorite Marvel characters and I am surprised. Not really. I, I kind of get why that uh, they haven't done him yet, but I'm a little shocked he hasn't been done in Marvel Crisis Protocol yet. Eventually, I'm sure. Well, the now that the the Turk the uh, what's it called? Now that the Kickstarter has like mostly been delivered, I think. I think a lot of people are starting to get theirs or have gotten theirs. Um, I wouldn't be. You should see them go on retail here soon. I know there were some that were Kickstarter exclusives, but... You guys probably can't even see what I'm about to do. Sorry. There's no real good way for me to show this. Just trying to paint these little lines back in here. But yeah, there, there's a. They should, they should be available for retail. I would think rather 
rather shortly. The Asteria on horseback it was really cool model. And the banner is the banner is pretty cool. It gives you a bunch of opportunity to paint some some fun free hand. I appreciate it when a uh, miniature has nice open spaces to do to do some freehand work. Did I get them all? Thanks. I think I got them all. All right. Now. Go back to the the black. We'll take some some black with the brown. Just cover these. The, the little ropes and everything. Yes, I painted the the one without the banner. Flaming hot, flaming hot bag. Hello, welcome. Thanks for following. Paint all the bottoms of the lanterns. Those nice and dark.
Yeah. The Asterion horseback is, um, she comes with alternate parts. So I have the flag actually. Um, yeah, you can either put her together with the flag or you can put her together and, and you can swap the heads. Now, I don't know if those are Kickstarter exclusive pieces or what. I know sometimes they do it that way. Personally, I prefer uh, like Kickstarter exclusive parts over Kickstarter exclusive figures in general. I think it's generally just a better consumer thing. Like make the figure available, but if you want to do limited edition pieces, that's cool. Yeah, I'm sure it'll be really, I'm sure it'll be clear what you're getting when, when it goes to retail. See, once we start painting all the the black parts into the lanterns, it's just making them look even brighter, right? Because you get that black right next to the the bright yellow and that extra contrast makes them look even brighter.
Okay. All right, let's uh, let's do a little work on his robe. So, I want this to stick with this like pale turquoise. Um, I'm gonna grab a. I don't need the glasses anymore for this. I'll just grab like a blue green. I can just mix it with a little black. check what my my value is so I need to go a little brighter than that okay that's oh, like the tone I want so now I can go around and just I like the robe in some places where I want a little extra light and definition. Pick out, pick out some of these edges and whatnot.
I don't want to go too crazy because I want to maintain the the nice, like, really dark feeling to the robe, but got to get some uh, shape and volume to the the robes and areas. And then we can bump the light up even more. I don't want to add too much color either, so I'm going to grab some of the white just to desaturate it a little bit. So white with the the blue and the black. That's about the, t the light I want there. Actually, I can grab some of this gray also. Could use this gray also. Right. Something like that. If I go overboard, it's easy to pull it back and blend it back in. Now I just want to make sure I get some of these shapes really well.
Let's step it down. Smaller brush. And then some of these areas, while I'm thinking about it, I want to restore some of that black. So things like this, some of these folds. Make sure under, underneath those is nice and dark. Okay. We're trying to make a, a beat up robe. It's not like silk, right? So make my my edge highlights kind of imperfect will help sell that effect better. Little bumps and holes and things. look like scratches in the cloth.
Right, then I gotta push the light even more. For the hood. I put quite a bit of light on the hood to try and combat some of the focus that's going to be naturally drawn downwards towards all that orange light. So I can kind of over highlight the hood and then knock it back where I where I need. I want some of these areas here, right by where his hood starts, or uh, collar, like ends. I'm going to push the light quite a bit up into these areas. So like here, and then I'm going to fade them down. It might not be like perfectly realistic. But it's going to help pull attention upwards. Okay.
Yeah, I mean, it's all about the contrast between the, because it's desaturated, right, the orange, it's going to push it more towards like a cyan color. Okay, now let's really play with the light right where I want to draw focus, so. Really gonna push some of this light right here. So I get this nice line of definition between his collar in the front of his robe. It's also going to make him feel a little bit more spectrally. Is that a word? Did I just make up a word? Had to paint spooky, spooky ghost man. Oh, we want him to feel unnatural, right? His robes almost have a glow of their own. Yeah, I'm just gonna blend this out with some texture, like a a little stippling and hatching, small lines, things like that. Just makes his robe look more worn.
See ya. Hi, Cryptic. How are you? Okay. I'm actually going to flip them this way so I can get to these edges a little easier. Right. This man. Push, push the light on his head just a little more. Really want that kind of ghostly moonlight thing going on. Really build that contrast and focus around his non-existent face.
It's all a trick. I installed LEDs while I was on my smoke break, and you guys didn't see. Phantasmal, that's the word I'm looking for. The glow, the light around his collar and head makes him look kind of phantasmal. Yeah, there you go. That's about how big he is. All right, if I mix just a little orange into this, see? I'm gonna take just a little bit of the orange And grab some here, right? I'll pull it off to the side. I grab a little orange, mix it in, and it's gonna desaturate it some. And I'll use a little more of that desaturated gray towards the bottom of his robes, closer to the light. That'll pull some of that blue color out. And make the, the transition between the two sections a little more natural. Still want the uh, kind of beat up worn edge to it. Something like that. King, KDM is like 42 millimeter. 
scale. It's it's roughly the same scale as uh, uh, like Marvel Crisis Protocol. He's he's a bit bigger though. He's he's a big boy. Hello. Hi, Chewy MP. Thanks for the follow. Yep, you're a big boy. Thanks. You can go back and uh, watch how it was done if you'd like. Or you can watch, if you want to watch uh, from the beginning. The uh, VODs are available on my YouTube. Everyone, please go subscribe to my YouTube. I'm almost at a thousand. Uh, it's at Eric Swenson. Same name. I'm the same everywhere. All my socials. Same thing. You can watch all the previous, well, not all of them, but most of the previous streams. At least from the last, like, few months. Hey, thanks, Dan. One of these days I'll figure out how to uh, make a chat bot. There you go. Smash, smash the like. Smash it. All these people keeping me pretty busy with uh, painting figures, so just haven't haven't found the the time to sit down and make one. I swear, I just get busier by the day.
cryptic. Thanks for the prime, man. Appreciate it. Yeah, join the Discord, whatever. You know, anybody new want to join the Discord? Got a nice community of painters. Could post your work in progress. Some, some, uh, you know, pretty solid painters in there, like, oh, like, uh, miniature monthly award-winning painters in, in the Discord just hanging out. This is why, Dan, I have, uh, well, makes sense for me. I don't have time to disconnect my stream camera. I have a separate camera just for taking photos. And even though I don't only stream once a week, I'm const like constantly recording what I'm painting, so. But when it's your job, it's tax deductible. And you can buy all the camera gear you want. I'm an open book. You can ask me anytime about lights or whatever. I don't care. I've got no secrets other than projects I'm working on. Those like that stuff, you know, I can't talk about. But other than that, Make sure I line around all these robes. Again, def the definition is important. I want these black lines. That separate 
the different layers of robe from each other. Eres un cuate muy amable. What is a cuate? ¿Qué es un cuate? Cuate, a nice guy. Ah, amigo. Uh, tío. <laughs> I have not heard cuate. Is that spe That's... Where is that from? Who uses that one? Whose slang is coate? Mexico. That is a new one for me. All right. Now. Grongnack. Hi, Grongnack. Welcome. Hey, how's that feel? Pretty good so far. Feeling pretty good about where he's at. Been live for four showers. Uh, I think, do I think I want to call it here for tonight? And then we can finish them next week, do all the little detaily parts and the base and, and finish them next week. I think that, I think that might be the thing to do. Okay, yeah, because it's 11. All right. So we'll, we'll finish him up next week.